Our gospel reading for today is the gospel according to Luke chapter 24 verses 36b to 48. Jesus himself stood among them and said to them, Peace be with you. They were startled and terrified and thought that they were seeing a ghost. He said to them, Why are you frightened? And why do doubts arise in your heart? Look at my hands and my feet. See that it is I myself. Touch me and see. For a ghost does not have flesh and bones as you see that I have. And when he had said this, he showed them his hands and his feet. While in their joy they were disbelieving and still wondering, he said to them, Have you anything here to eat? They gave him a piece of broiled fish, and he took it and ate it in their presence. Then he said to them, These are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you that everything written about me in the Law of Moses, the Prophets, and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds to understand the Scriptures, and he said to them, Thus it is written that the Messiah is to suffer and to rise from the dead on the third day, and that repentance and forgiveness of sins is to be proclaimed in his name to all nations, beginning from Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. God still speaks to us through the words of the scriptures. Thanks be to God. Peace be with you. If you are feeling skeptical about the resurrection, Luke's gospel is a good one to read. In Luke's version, a group of women go to the tomb find the stone rolled away and the body gone. Suddenly two messengers appear, terrifying them but explaining that Jesus has risen. The women run to tell the disciples, the rest of the disciples, but the men mostly decide that the women must be making up a story. Later, two disciples are traveling to Emmaus and meet a stranger. They tell the stranger about Jesus' death and about the women telling this unbelievable story. The stranger is Jesus, but the two followers don't recognize him, even when he discusses the scriptures with them. It is only when this stranger prays over their meal and hands them bread that they recognize him, but he disappears. The two race back to tell the other disciples. In today's passage, Jesus suddenly appears again among the disciples, and they are terrified. Even after the women's story and the Emmaus story, when Jesus appears, their first thought is that he is a ghost. Jesus tells them to look at his hands and feet, touch him, and see that it really is him. When they react with joy but still do not believe it, Jesus asks for food and eats it in their presence. Surely a ghost wouldn't eat fish. <laughs> I love how Luke tells these stories because they make it so easy for the reader or the original hearer to identify with the disciples. Luke uses all of these words and phrases to give us a strong sense of the disciples' emotions. Puzzled, terrified, thought it was an idle tale, amazed, astounded, hearts burning within us, startled, terrified, seeing a ghost, disbelieving and still wondering. If Luke had told the story where Jesus rose and everybody was happy and believed right away, it wouldn't connect so strongly with us, and it wouldn't convince those who are skeptical. But if we do come to the story with a tendency to not believe, we have to admit that in the story, the disciples didn't either and had to be convinced by many different people and proofs. The details that Luke shares help us to know that, yes, this was the same Jesus who died on the cross with the same body, 
although changed in some mysterious way. Matthew, Luke, and John all include stories that confirm that this is a body that you can touch. In contrast to Greek teaching about the separation, the duality of the body and the spirit, with the body perishing and the spirit being freed from it, the Gospels tell us that this is a resurrection of an embodied person, not just a spirit. The resurrected Jesus has the same body that was crucified, with holes in his hands and his feet. And he is recognizably himself. And yet it is also a transformed body. He can appear through locked doors, vanishes after breaking the bread in Emmaus, isn't always recognizable. Jesus' body has been redeemed, transformed, risen. He can both eat fish and disappear at will. I always feel that this is an essential part of our story that at times gets overlooked. We sometimes have a tendency to make the resurrection into a metaphor, just a pretty story about how the spirit lives on or about how there's life after death or hope after despair. And all those ideas have value, of course, but the testimony of the Bible is very clear. The crucified Jesus did not stay dead. His appearance astounded, confused, and terrified people. He had to let them feed him, let them touch him, show them the marks where the nails pierced his flesh, before his followers would believe that this miracle had happened. Story after story and witness after witness demonstrate this. I'm grateful for this reminder that bodies are apparently important to God because it affirms that the world of stuff, of stardust and dirt and atoms and DNA is inherently good and blessed and not secondary to our minds and spirits. It's all one. As we celebrate Earth Day on April 22nd, we remember that the whole of the created Earth is like this. It's material, it's fragile, it's strong and messy and beautiful and valuable. Theologian Dr. Sally McFaig wrote a book asking us to imagine that the world, that the cosmos, was the body of God in some real way. Not that God was not also transcendent beyond us, but that God was indeed imminent in the things of nature. God was incarnate not just in Jesus, but in all of creation, and that we can come to know God by being in creation. This reminds me of one of my favorite E.E. E. Cummings poems. I thank you, God, for most this amazing day, for the leaping, greenly spirits of trees, and a blue, true dream of sky, and for everything which is natural, which is infinite, which is yes. I who have died am alive again today, and this is the sun's birthday. This is the birthday of life and of love and wings, and of the gay, great, happening, illimitably earth. How should tasting, touching, hearing, seeing, breathing, any lifted from the know of all nothing human, human merely being, doubt unimaginable you? Now the ears of my ears awake and now the eyes of my eyes are opened. I love that. The poet seems to be sharing with us that God's splendor, God's power and majesty and love all can be experienced in the material reality of the earth. Creation testifies to God's present, 
presence. How can any mere human being doubt you, Cummings says, if they see the beauty of the world? And the material world is both concrete and mysterious for the poet. He says, thank you for everything which is natural, which is infinite, which is yes. I love that. It captures what many of us, if not all, know from our own experience. Whether it is working in a garden, walking in the woods, skiing on a snowy mountaintop, swimming in a lake, or looking over the waters of the Salish Sea, we can feel that stirring within us. The diversity, the beauty, the wonder of creation can indeed feel like a big yes! And as we are part of creation, part of us connects to that and can find healing and restoration from spending time in the natural world. Just a few years ago, there was a book that described the Japanese practice of forest bathing, spending time under a canopy of trees and just soaking it all in as a healing practice. But the idea of being healed by nature has been around for a very long time. As philosopher Henry David Thoreau said in 1854, we can never have enough of nature. We must be refreshed by the sight of the wilderness with its living and its decaying trees, the thundercloud and the rain which lasts three weeks, we need to witness our own limits transgressed and some life pasturing freely where we will never wander. Creation not only heals and refreshes us, it calls us to remember who we are and whose we are. The first stories of the Bible remind us that we are part of an interconnected and interdependent creation. And as humans, we were giving, given the task of looking after it all. Nature is resilient, but it cannot withstand the degradation that our over-consuming human activities bring to it. Earth Day is a great time to renew our commitment to being stewards of the planet, not just users of its resources. Faith tells us that the earth and its creatures have their own value that is separate from what we can get out of them. And Jesus shows us the way of laying down our old lives to take up practices that will help others live. Last year, we explored Barbara Brown Taylor's book, An Altar in the World, and were reminded of the spiritual practice of wearing skin. Our bodies are what we have in common with each other, with other creatures, and even in a way with the created world. And when we honor our own bodies and the bodies of our neighbors, we return to that sense of the interconnected creation. We remembered that Jesus was concerned about people's bodies, that they needed feeding and healing and caring for. In his last instructions to the disciples, he gave them practical, tangible things to do after he was gone. He told them to break bread and share a cup to remember him. He taught them to wash each other's feet, to remind them of their call to be servants. He received the gift of anointing in front of them, demonstrating how to receive love and care, as well as to give it. We are embodied people living in relationship with the living earth and all its creatures. For so many of us, we experience God's real presence in our bodies as we feel the sunshine on our skin, as we sing a moving song, as we walk in the rain, as we taste a wonderful meal, as we belly laugh with a friend. Our bodies and the body of the earth are holy and deserve respect, 
and compassion, healing, and love. May we as people of faith lead the way as we seek to bring healing to our earth, to our fellow human beings, and to ourselves, spirit, mind, and body. Amen. I invite you to sing with me a lovely old creation song to me, Joyful, Joyful, We Adore You, Voices United, number 232.